A nation that controls space will control the future. Welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we will learn about the military and civilian implications of humanity's expansion into space. Today we will start to cover the dynamics of rescue and defense operations in space. If you want to make it to a damaged ship in time to save the crew, or if you have to defend a mining colony from claim jumpers, you will need a fast ship. This introduction to space warfare propulsion will help you understand what is available and the benefits and drawbacks to different propulsion systems. As the klaxon sounds and you are leaving the barracks on your way to choose a pursuit craft that will be robotically assembled for you and prepared for flight as you make your way to the hangar bay, you have to ask yourself the most important question. How far am I going and how long do I have to get there? If you are responding to a loss of atmosphere in a research vessel on the far side of the moon and you are at L1, your choice will be very different than if you are going out to investigate an attack that wiped out a mining facility on Callisto. Let's look at what is available with current technology. Remember it is your sworn responsibility to uphold the rights of all sentient beings and the prime directive is primum non nocere, first do no harm. As a member of Space Force or some other national or international space-based rapid response team, you will need to leave the orbiting base and quickly locate those in danger or those endangering others. Your space interceptor will need a very effective propulsion system. Let's look at the currently available options. Spacecraft propulsion comes down to throwing material out the back of the craft with as much momentum as possible. So two things are needed propellant and energy. Let's look at some equations that will help you know which fuel, propellant, and energy requirements you're going to have. Now the force exerted by your engine will be equal to the mass fuel flow, the mass of the fuel flowing through your engine per second times the ejection velocity of that propellant. Now when I say fuel, for chemical rockets, fuel and propellant are the same thing. The fuel is the fuel and oxidizer that burns in the combustion chamber and then the propellant is the breakdown of uh, the uh, combustion products thrown out the back. For other types of engines, fuel or energy source and propellant are two different things. We'll get into that. To change your velocity, a change in velocity is equal to your initial velocity added to the velocity of the ejected propellant times the natural log of your initial mass times your final mass. And what that means is the ratio of how much fuel you use. That will tell you your change in velocity. And we have maps that tell us what velocity change is necessary to go from anywhere in the solar system to anywhere else. You can go from Earth to the Moon, you can go from low Earth orbit to L1, or from L1, where we are now, to your rescue point. Now, no matter what you use for propulsion, you're going to need energy. Chemical rockets that we are all familiar with get that energy by burning two reactive chemicals in a combustion chamber creating heat and pressure. The chamber has an opening or throat through which the products of combustion travel. The subsonic movement of the gas in the combustion chamber becomes sonic in the throat and supersonic on expansion in the nozzle. This way you get both the energy and the propellant in one process. Thermal energy from burning the fuel and propellant uh, form the combustion products. There are several chemicals that can be used for this purpose. Chemical fuels are rated in performance by a standard measure called specific impulse. Specific impulse can be considered the amount of time that one pound could be hovered in the, in, let's say in the air against Earth's gravity. So one pound of fuel which is a, a measure of weight, remember, not mass, will produce one pound of thrust for a certain period of time depending on the energy content of the fuel. 
Now, if we use kilograms, which is a measure of mass, we have to convert that to weight and say that one kilogram of fuel will produce one kilogram times 9.8 meters per second squared, the force of gravity on Earth, which would be newtons of force for whatever period of time. So one kilogram of fuel producing 9.8 newtons of force is the same as one pound of fuel producing one pound of force. Now RP-1, or rocket propellant 1, was used in the Saturn V F-1 engines and has a specific impulse of 358 seconds. That means that one pound of RP-1 burned with the appropriate amount of oxidizer would levitate a one pound mass against Earth's gravity for 358 seconds. RP-1 is fairly dense, not taking up too much volume compared to the oxidizer you must carry to burn with it. So let's look at a Falcon 9. You will notice that the fuel and oxidizer tanks are almost the same size. This is an effective spacecraft fuel for most applications. Now RP-1 is just highly refined kerosene so that most of the molecular weight of the hydrocarbons is the same. If you choose this fuel, you'll probably choose the proven Merlin engine for your ship, or maybe the RD-180, designed by the former Soviet Union and flown on the American Atlas rocket. The Merlin is a gas generator engine, while the RD-180 is a staged combustion engine. Staged combustion is much more efficient. However, the thrust to weight ratio for the Merlin is 96 with a maximum thrust of 1 meganewton and a mass of 470 kilograms, while the RD-180 has a thrust to weight ratio of 78, with a maximum thrust of 4.15 meganewtons and a mass of 5,480 kilograms. You would need almost five Merlin engines to outmatch the RD-180, but they are quite a bit lighter, and you would save 3,130 kilograms of mass. Plus, an engine failure wouldn't leave you stranded, as you would have four more engines. You'll have to factor these differences into your choice. But before you do, there are more fuels to consider. Hydrogen fuel, like that used in the Space Shuttle main engines, or RS-25, are the most efficient rocket engines flown to date, and have a specific impulse of about 455 seconds in space. The RL-10 is a smaller, very efficient engine that uses this fuel. Hydrogen is not, however, very dense, and your tanks will need to be enormous. The fuel is also cryogenic, meaning it must be kept very cold, about 20 Kelvin, to prevent excessive boil-off. The liquid oxygen does not have to be as cold. At about 90 Kelvin, it will do okay. But remember that while space overall has an average temperature of 4 Kelvin, where you are at L1 and anywhere near Earth has an average temperature of 283 Kelvin going up and down by about 100 Kelvin in each direction. By the way, start thinking in Kelvin. It will help you compare different temperatures involved in space flight better than other scales. A short duration trip would not cause the loss of much fuel, but on a long duration flight, it could be a problem. Keep this in mind. Methane is carbon with four hydrogen atoms, covalently bonded, and it is being planned for use in the BE-4 engine from Blue Origin and the Raptor engine from SpaceX. It has a specific impulse of 369 seconds and can be stored at about 110 Kelvin. It burns very clean without some of the soot or coking problems of RP-1. Now, hypergolics are chemicals that explode on contact. These are usually toxic but can sit around a long time. They have been used in the American Titan rocket and is still used in some modern rockets such as the Proton-M by the Russians and the Draco engines on the sides of the Dragon spacecraft flown by SpaceX. These chemicals are usually toxic and must be handled with caution. An accidental spill and inhalation can be fatal. Now the limits of chemical engines. The highest impulse from any chemical rocket engine was 542 seconds using lithium and fluorine for the chemical reaction and adding hydrogen to cool it down a little. This would be a tripropellant. 
Now these chemicals are harder to find, hard to store, and hard to work with, and they're very toxic. Hydrogen can be made from water on the moon and is readily, readily available, as is methane that can be a, produced from carbon dioxide and hydrogen on, the moon, on Mars or the moon, excess carbon dioxide from life support systems for the colonies or from animals used for food supplies, can be ran through a Sabatier converter to produce methane for refueling a ship such as the SpaceX Starships that will use methane as they start their colonization of Mars. But these aren't your only choices. Ion engines exist also, and they are uniquely suited to space flight. They take a propellant, usually a noble gas, knock an electron off of it, and then use magnetic fields to move it through the engine. The ions can be, then be thrown out the back using magnetic fields or heated with radio waves like in a Vassimer engine. Now let's look at how these two work. The Hall thruster was designed long ago by the Soviets and works by putting a noble gas in a chamber between an anode and a cathode. A powerful electric field is created that knocks the electron off the atom, creating an ion. The electric field also creates a powerful magnetic force at right angles to the electric field. The ion having a charge feels this force and is thrown out the engine at high speed, really high speed. For as you can multiply specific impulse by 9.8 and get a rough estimate of ejection velocity, 455 becomes 4,459 meters per second, this ion engine can throw the propellant out the back at up to 30,000 meters per second, giving a specific impulse of about 3,060. This is 6.7 times better than the best hydrogen chemical rocket engine. The next engine to look at is the Vassimer engine for variable specific impulse magnetoplasma rocket. In the Vassimer engine, the noble gas from the propellant tank is put in a chamber where radio waves are used to ionize it. It can be moved with magnetic fields and is sent into a heating chamber. The heating chamber then heats the propellant to up to one million Kelvin and uses superconducting magnets to keep the super hot gas from contacting the chamber walls. No known substance could withstand that heat. The heat of the sun, the surface of the sun is about 5,800 Kelvin. We're looking at a million Kelvin. This heated propellant is sent out the back of the engine at up to 50,000 meters per second, giving a specific impulse of 5,102. This is even better than the Hall thruster and looks like the best choice until you consider the mass and energy requirements and the thrust of these engines. The chemical engines can pump massive quantities of fuel and oxidizer into the combustion chamber usually using a turbo pump powered by using a little bit of the oxidizer and fuel giving a tremendous force for a very limited period of time. You run out of fuel in just a few minutes. The ion engines can only process a relatively tiny amount of propellant at any one time. Also, the energy for the chemical rockets comes from the combustion process of the fuel and oxidizer. But there is no combustion in an ion engine. The energy to power the engine must come from somewhere else. This is their biggest drawback. Both engines can work with argon as a propellant. Though you get better results with krypton or xenon, these are rare and expensive. Argon is found on Mars and, and Earth, making up about 1% of Earth's atmosphere. The power, however, must come from somewhere. So you either have to use combustion to produce energy to run your ion engine, you'd be better off just burning it in a chemical engine, or you have to use solar energy. Solar energy is limited by the flux or energy output of the Sun. At the orbit of the Earth and at L1, that's about 1400 watts per square meter. And the efficiency of your solar panels, say 40% is the best achieved in labs, but only really 20% efficiency is readily available. So that would give us 280 watts per square meter. Your vast burner will need at least 200 kilowatts to produce only 5 newtons of force. Remember the chemical engines were rated in meganewtons. Even the 200 kilowatt power needed will require uh, solar panels of 200,000 watts divided by 280 watts per meter 
is a 714 square meter. So about 27 meters or about 89 feet per side. This is a pretty big square to give you only 200 kilowatts of power. Why would we ever consider this engine? Because it can fire for not just a few minutes like the chemical engines, but thousands of hours. On a long enough journey, firing for a long enough period of time, it will be much faster than any chemical engine possibly can without running out of propellant. Deep Space One was the first probe to use this technology. It was built by a Star Trek fan, by the way. An ion drive like the Vassimer with sufficient power to run it could make it to Mars in a little more than a month, about 39 days, instead of the five to 10 months needed to get to Mars with chemical engines. And remember, this is a rescue mission. You cannot wait for optimal planetary alignment. What other power sources are available to us if we want to use this wonderful engine? The Soviets, yes, they were incredible when it came to space science, built and flew the Topaz series of reactors. Topaz 1 could power 5 kilowatts, could produce 5 kilowatts of power for up to 5 years using enriched uranium and had a mass of 320 kilograms and was flown and used by the Soviets for over a year. You would need 40 of these just to power your Vassimer, giving you a mass of 12,800 kilograms for your power system. Ad Astra, the makers of the engine designed by the former astronaut Dr. Chang Diaz, has announced that they can use electrical energy with up to 97% efficiency. Now these nuclear power sources generate a lot of heat, but you could use hydrogen as a coolant. The resultant heated hydrogen uh, could be added to the thrust. This is the most efficient way to go long distances. Why not just use the heat of the nuclear reactor to heat hydrogen and use that for thrust in a nuclear thermal rocket engine? It has been done, at least on the ground. The NERVA project built engines and tested them by the Americans in the 1960s and produced a specific impulse of about 900 with a theoretical limit of about 1,000. This is twice as efficient as the best chemical rocket engines, but they are a little large. With a mass of 18,144 kilograms, it will take a lot of thrust just to overcome the inertia. For short, short duration flights, this would be optimal if your ship is big enough to have enough propellant to get there. And stop. Don't forget stopping. And coming back. And stopping again. They'll dock your pay if you punch your ship through the star base on your way back. But there is another option. A liquid fluoride thorium reactor could have a spherical core of about one meter and produce one megawatt of thermal energy. Now the most powerful NERVA is called Kiwi B and it ran at 1,000 megawatts or one terawatt for a brief time. This would be great for a battleship, but because it's very massive, you might want continuous power for your ion drive with a little less size. So for your long-range missions, you're going to use a small lifter reactor cooled by liquid hydrogen that is then used to produce thrust, the electricity from which we run through our Vassimer. One of the unique things about the Vassimer is that it can be varied, hence the variable part of the name. It can go from high thrust, low efficiency, to low thrust, high efficiency. You will calculate your fuel needs, allowing a 30% safety margin and plot your course for a 35% propellant, propellant usage on the way out and 35% on the way back. Factoring in the thrust of the hydrogen coolant and your argon propellant needs. Hopefully by the time you reach the hangar and get your ship, you've fed the destination into the AI and it has selected the right power source, fuel type and propellant type for your mission and has 3D printed the necessary tanks and attach the reactor and engines as well as your command module to the front of the craft and you're ready to go. Good luck and be safe.